All right. Welcome back. I think this is a good time to start, as good a time as any to start. Welcome back. How, just for my curiosity, who has not started writing their lit review and whatnot for the project milestone? Who has not started? Don't be shy. Okay, maybe this is a good time to remind you that we can help you and give you some feedback if you submitted for the milestone. And the quality of your writing and reports will be significantly higher if you do that at the end. So just, just a thought, something to consider. Okay, All right. So um, remind me first, this thing that we talked about on Tuesday, uh, and I want us to play with this hands-on today uh, to give you some real exposure to what it takes to, to run these models and interpret them. Uh, but first, remind me what we talked about. Like, what was this? Why do I show this picture? What am I referring to? And why was this interesting? Anybody? I see Matt. The time series with intervention with two different trends for Right. So this is a very common type of data that you might end up needing to analyze at some point. Um, it's temporal data, so you know observations over time of some something, some variables, um, and you're looking to evaluate in the scenario the effects of a particular intervention, uh, represented here by this vertical line in the middle, uh, and that could be anything. It could be new policy, it could be some tool that you've added or whatever. It could be something. Thing, you know, something you've changed in the environment and you're looking to observe its effects, et cetera. Lots of things could happen. Could be COVID or whatever else, right? Lots of things fit this uh, pattern of, you know, temporal data with some intervention. And often the goal is to evaluate the effects of that intervention. Um, and we talked about how this interrupted time series analysis method it's a pretty clever one, pretty powerful one. Why did I say that? Except to annoy Sam, I assume. Uh, Matt again. Because uh, it gives you evidence for causality. Or it can give you evidence for causality. How so? Um, well, because you, you see that the change is subsequent to the intervention. And um, there are a few things that you also have to do. You also have to you know, um, address any other possible explanations as well that are, that are plausible. Just one more thing to consider. Um, so you have to be able to show the association. Right. So we talked about how of the three ingredients, remember the, the magic three ingredients for establishing a causal relationship. This gets close to doing that. Right, the cause precedes the effect by design. You know, the intervention happened at some point, you observed it, or you're the one that introduced it or not. It doesn't really matter. It happened at some point. You measure things subsequently you know, after that. So you have temporal precedence. You measure some correlation. We're going to do that hands on today, right? So you, you get this association numerically. You can quantify it. You can you know, test if it's statistically significant and whatnot. You do all of that. So they get, that gives you two. And the third one, you know, how can you exclude plausible alternative explanations? That's the, the one that, you know, we sort of, you know, got Sam upset about last time or something. Uh, we kind of get that, but not quite entirely, right? How, like, why don't we get that entirely? Like, what, so what why do I, get, why do we get that at all? Like, to what extent do we get that? And what are we still missing? So let me, let me be very specific. Luke? Uh, I guess what we're, we're still missing um, is that we haven't necessarily ruled out um, all of the possible alternative explanations because the third of the three magic. How, how so? Right. Uh, something else could have occurred um, at, at exactly the same time. So let's say this is a policy change, um, and if there was some sort of like omnibus bill that had multiple policies in it. Uh, so if we're we're trying, we're, maybe we think it's the first policy that had this effect, but maybe the second and third policies also. Effect of this as well. 
Um, so it's we, we can't know which one of those for sure, just for this information. Okay, yeah. So Luke says for folks on Zoom, if that wasn't loud enough, Luke says, you know, there may be multiple interventions that co-occurred with the one we're evaluating. And we can't really be sure if the effects we're observing are due to the one we're testing or partly or entirely due to some of the other ones, you know, if there were other ones co-occurring. That's the one part we're missing. But I, I, you know, I claim that we can still get some of this. It's not entirely hopeless. Why did I claim that? Like, how can we get anything uh, at all in terms of plausible alternative explanations? Yep. Okay. Because we can add some of the things that we expect to be confounding variables into the model. Like for example, the one we did last time was, like, oh, if say we could track the air quality and then just add that as another variable in the model. Variable. That was a trick, right? So remember, we're still operating in this multiple regression framework where you could plug in more variables to control for these other things that you expect are plausible alternative explanations. But we can always do that. So as long as we can measure some of them, we can control for them. Right? So that's the part that I you know, claimed that I was excited about. I, I claimed that it gets us you know, closer. Okay, so you know, maybe there's still some that we can't measure. And therefore, you know, if we can't measure them, we can't include them in the model and we can't exclude them from, as plausible alternative explanations. That's the part we're still missing. But so long as we can measure you know, some of them, uh, the ones that we believe are plausible, most of them, all of them, whatever, as long as we can measure lots of these plausible alter alternative explanations, we can uh, control for them in the model. Okay, so this is a really powerful, you know, very simple and really powerful design because it gets you almost there, right? Without actually running an experiment, which is awesome. Because, uh, you know, often you can't actually run an experiment no matter how much you would like to. Okay, so that was the idea. This is why this is such a powerful design. Right? You can set up your you know, data collection and analysis in this way, and you can measure you know, these plausible alternative explanations and, and control for them in the model explicitly. You're in good shape. It's still not perfect, right? It'll never be as good as a randomized control trial. Right? We have to accept that. It will never be as good as that, but it's pretty good otherwise. Okay. So that was the that was the idea. I'm really excited about this because it's you know, on the one hand very simple conceptually, and on the other hand very powerful. I think. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do today is actually uh, have you play with this. So what I've done is I let me post. Uh, I've made some sample uh, data, uh, and. I've shared that with you. I'm going to post it in the Slack channel and in the Zoom chat. Uh, you should be able to access this to the CMU uh, login. Let me know if not. Um, and so it's, it's first of all, this data set that you see here uh, represented in my document. Um, and you can, well, first even download the data from the shared drive. You can set your working directory to that folder if you want to uh, have an easier time uh, loading and saving stuff from there, or from wherever you save it. Um, you should read this data set in. And you could you know, do that with uh, this read underscore uh, CSV function or otherwise. Um, and then here's the first part of this. Okay. So assuming this intervention at time 100, I'd like you to uh, estimate a linear model as discussed in class uh, and test if there are statistically significant changes in either level or trend following the intervention. Okay. Um, and then I'd like you to do this uh, in two ways. So I have, in this data that I've shared with you, I've prepared all the variables that we talked about in class, you know, these counters for time and the dummy for intervention and whatnot. 
Um, you can do this in two ways, and I would like you to do that explicitly in both ways. You know, the second way is including an interaction effect, interaction term in your model with just two of the variables we need. The first way, the I think more interpretable way, um, has all three of them. So it has the separate time counter after the intervention. So I could show you what this looks like if you're curious. Um, do, 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 let's see. This. Yeah, so the data set I've shared with you looks like this. So there's an X and a Y, that's the outcome. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay. There's an X and a Y. There's a counter for time. There's a dummy for intervention, uh, true or false, depending on where you are relative to the intervention. And there's the separate counter for time uh, that starts ticking after the intervention. You can uh, see that it's zero, just sleeps for the first half uh, and starts uh, ticking at some point after the intervention. Okay. So that's the first part. I want you to estimate these two models or the same model in two ways. And I, I want us to discuss the results altogether. I want to see what you get in terms of the coefficients. So I'm going to put this back up on the screen. So you have the instructions, but you also have them in the document. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Which, which library did you want us to use for the time series model again? Um, just a simple linear model. The default LM is fine. You're welcome to talk to your neighbors if you want or you know, talk to me or Bobo otherwise. Can we do anything to the data to make this easier to interpret? This was, I mean, it was all complicated. We had to think a lot about this, right? The, the 100 value here was a little confusing to me at least. So how can we make this easier to interpret? Any clever ideas? Could you make the intervention time zero and then like negative and then positive? On either that's side it. of intervention. That's it. That's the trick. Center the intervention at zero instead of currently 100. If I center the intervention at zero, this will all work out uh, more nicely. So I, I, we leave that as homework to the reader. Okay, okay, very good. Thanks a lot, Elijah. So this was good. Now, has anybody gotten to the second part? The second part is, let's talk about that for a second too. Second part is, we're actually, okay, so stop. What, uh, what are we missing, right? So, you know, let's say we're uh, testing and this was a causal effect here. What are we missing, right? We're missing the part about other things that could have happened at the same time that we haven't modeled explicitly, right? So a common strategy to deal with that is what? 
what do we have in experiments that we don't yet have here? That's it. In experiments, we have a control group that is otherwise indistinguishable from the group that was treated, except for the intervention. And we're comparing the effects amongst treated to effects of the placebo uh, amongst the ones that were in the control group. So that's what we can also do here to make this a lot stronger than it was so far. Um, and so for example, you know, let's say, let's say I actually have access to data about the control group that is similar to the ones that were treated, except for the intervention. Okay. Let's say I do that. So the question becomes one of comparing the change after the intervention amongst the ones that were treated to the change after the pseudo intervention, there was no intervention among the controls, but they were you know, observed at the same time. So they captured these other plausible alternative explanations. Okay. So the question now is not one of what happened after relative to what was before amongst treated, but rather how does what happened after compared to before amongst treated compare to what happens what happened after compared to before amongst the controls does that make sense okay so the counterfactual here you know if oh by the way so important assumption right so why do i trust that the red uh, points here in this example are a good control group because they have parallel trends in the outcome variable before the intervention. They could have had overlapping trends, that's maybe even stronger, but at least they have parallel trends. Okay, so the only difference between these two groups in this example is assumed to be the actual intervention, the treatment. But you know, you still see some difference in the control group, perhaps because of these other things that happened at the same time. Right, maybe you know air quality also got better because they shut down the whatever the coal plant. Okay, so the you know number of cases of whatever acute coronary events that we were tracking last time, maybe that goes down naturally, you know, for other reasons other than the policy, the smoking ban. Okay, but you know you could see how maybe they go down at a higher rate or whatever, you know, more so amongst the ones that were subject to the smoking ban, even though they you know, go down in general for everybody. Okay, So you can see how this is a much more powerful design. I can be much more confident, right? If I have a good control group, I can be much more confident that the effect is closer to causal now than, than we were before when we did not have a control group. Does that make sense? Where's Sam? He should complain about something. Sam, I, do you have can I sure. can I can I be a replacement, Sam, for a really quick second? Yes. So I'm I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm a little bit confused because I hear you saying that like this gets us closer to be able to being able to claim causality, but we can't though, actually, right? Like that's with a time series. Like I'm a little confused. Can we um, actually? We, all of these are causal inference techniques. So you know we can, with varying degrees of confidence, uh, insofar as one can ever, from observational data. Um, it's never going to be as uh, convincing as a randomized control trial, but it's going to be uh, as convincing as it gets from observational data only. 
Sounds good. Thank you. That makes sense. Following up on that, so if you use the word we, there is a causal link with moderate accuracy or with like moderate confidence or however, but if you use the word causal, it will not be rejected if we use this methodology. Because this is, you know, in econometrics, this is standard causal inference methodology. So you know, people have come to accept that it's hard to do. There are things we're going to talk more about other things also you know, in two weeks when I come back. There are other things one could do, but this is about as good as it will ever get with the observational data. Uh, right, so you know you can't run an experiment; it's not randomized control. But but these two groups are you know otherwise similar enough. So you know you, you make assumptions, but you're confident that the assumptions are reasonable, right? Because you see these uh, matching trends in uh, the outcome variable between the two groups. I, so one objection I've had to this in the past, personally, you know, so all of these methods require this parallel trends assumption. To me, intuitively, it seems more convincing if it's just identical trends, not parallel trends. Like there's still some difference here. These things, you know, uh, the control group here has a higher rate of whatever acute coronary events. Than the treated group. So, so you know, I, I can't be as confident that they're really indistinguishable, the two groups, because they're already different. I can see they're different, even though they change, they evolve at the same rate, but they are somehow qualitatively different. So to me, intuitively, I would be more convinced if I could, you know, assemble, compile the control group in such a way that it perfectly overlaps the trend in the treated group, if that makes sense. Uh, but it's easier to illustrate this in the figure if they're different. So, uh, for the purpose of this example, I'm I'm, I'm showing you this, uh, you know, these very different trends. I think you know, if I were to do this, I would try to compile the control group in such a way that the trends are actually identical, not just parallel. That seems more convincing to me. Okay, so now how do we model this? Let's, can we expand on the linear models from before to model both of these jointly? Uh, and I've given you this data in the other, in DF2, the other file has all of this data. Uh, has anybody gone this far? Any ideas what we could do? I promise you'll like it when you see it. Any ideas?
Okay, so here's the trick I was just mentioning. Uh, So what I did is I took, remember there were two kinds of Y's. There was a Y among, there was a Y among controls. I took all of the controls, all of the Y's from the controls, and I moved them to the bottom of the Y's from treated. Uh, so if I scroll through this, you will find them. Oops. Okay, so the first 200 rows are the treated ones. And then I just moved the controls to the bottom. And I added a dummy variable that keeps track of which group I'm in. Does that make sense? Okay, it's just a flag. It tells me if I am treated or controlled so I can keep track of where the Y's came from. Because right, otherwise they wouldn't know where they came from anymore. Uh, and then I have the same things I had before. I have a, a dummy for intervention that's you know true or false depending where I'm at on the x-axis. Um, and I can have the two counters for time and time after. Or if you do the interaction term style uh, specification, you don't need the one after, but same, same idea. Okay. So now if I do this, you will hopefully see So what's the model? How do I specify a model? I'll give you another couple of minutes to think about this before I show you. With this new trick, what's the model? Let me show you the data again. So hopefully that's useful. Here. Okay, I'll show you because we're running short of time. Has anybody figured it out? Let me show you. Is 
So here's the data we just created. Here's the model. So it's one important difference compared to the one we had before. It's still the same thing, but it's time plus intervention plus time after intervention. This is the expanded version of that specification. You could do this with interactions in the same way. Okay. And then plus the group I'm in. And then interactions between the group and all of the previous three things. Right, so group with time, group with intervention, and group with time after intervention. Okay, and now when I when I estimate this, well, I don't have space on the screen. Okay, when I estimate this, I get all the same coefficients from before, mostly, except now I have to take the interaction into account. So they're a little bit more complicated to interpret, but it's mostly all the same coefficients from before, plus estimates of the difference in each of these between the two groups. So a difference in slope before the intervention between the two groups, note how this coefficient is zero, right? That tells you there is no difference in trends before the intervention between the two groups by construction, because that's how we made it. The trends are parallel by construction, right? I'm the one that created the data. There is no difference in slopes before the intervention. So yeah, the model tells you that too. Okay. And then it tells you how much the trend changed between groups by about a quarter. Yeah, that's how much it changed between them, right? This one is less steep than the other one, uh, et cetera, right? How much the level changed, the level change differs between the two groups. Okay. So the interaction terms here, the, the coefficients estimated for the interaction terms are estimates of the difference in each of these characteristics, you know, slopes, ch changes in level, et cetera, between control and treated. It's really beautiful. And now if you set this up with you know, interactions, you get rid of this other term, it's even simpler and more beautiful. Uh, but I leave that as homework since we're on time. I don't wanna keep it too much. Right. One more thing I wanna say, like if you, if you understand this example that we talked about today, if you understand how to play with factors and uh, you know, interact things in models and interpret these coefficients, and in this example from today, if you really understand this one, you could do anything with regression ever. It's, it all boils down to this in some form. Like if you figure this one out, you will be uh, invincible with you know any flavor of regression and anything more complicated. Um, so like you know, please like really think about this because. It's a really useful, I promise. Uh, you won't believe me now, but you will come back and you know, you'll know you tell me later. It's a really useful uh, skill. Okay, so happy uh, social network analysis lectures next week. I'll see you in two weeks. Remember I'm traveling. <laughs>